All right, this is gonna be a long review. We're gonna talk the idiot by Leaf Bottomin. Get your tea, get a snack, get a project that you have been meaning to kind of sit down and work on for a long time and you just need some background noise. Get it now. The Idiot by Leaf Bottomin. One of my top reads of 2022. Let's jump into this. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Alana and I like to talk about books on the YouTubes because, you know, what else is a nerd gonna do? The Idiot by Alif Bottomin is one of those books that I picked up because I have a self-assigned reading project where I read through millennial fiction titles that I'm selecting and analyzing and thinking about what constitutes millennial fiction? That's a weird way to put that. What makes up millennial fiction? Mill mill that's a time. Millennial fiction. What is millennial fiction? What are the common themes that millennial authors are writing about and playing with? And my hypothesis is that we're going to see a lot of existential crisis going on. <laughs> now, then only that, just what kind of settings are they placing these stories in? I do kind of see a trend with millennial writers setting things in the early 2000s and the 90s where we don't have this social media, this intense social media presence. And some of them are setting them in current times. I think we're going to see, be seeing, especially as we're coming out of COVID, see a lot of millennial authors, especially with post pandemic fiction. And I think that'll be really interesting. And that doesn't really bother me because why do you think we see so many novels about World War II? When you have these things that happen in society that are just so, I'm not thinking, I was going to use the word precedent or unprecedented, but that's just so overused, that are just so world altering. You're going to see it in fiction and I think that's fine. It's also a way for people to kind of cope with what they've gone through. I'm not going to belabor this intro any longer because this is one of my longest reviews I've ever written to date. And because this book blew me away and I was not expecting it to because I'm not really expecting to get on with a lot of the books within this category of millennial fiction. I do struggle a lot with contemporary fiction. However, disclaimer, Alif Bottomin is not a millennial. She's Gen X. She was born in 1979, but I'm throwing her in here because one, she's read by a lot of millennials in Gen Z, even though I'm not talking about Gen Z. Gen Z is not really putting out fiction yet, are they? I don't really, I don't really think so. A lot of them are still teenagers, if not preteens. Um, but they're read by, uh, this book is read by a lot of millennials and because she is born in 1979 and millennials start at 18, 18, wow, 1981, there's a lot of crossover. And this book alone is already one massive existential crisis. And I love an existential crisis in a narrative. We're going to start with a quote. Suddenly it occurred to me that maybe the point of writing wasn't just to record something past, but also to prolong the present. So what is the idiot about? Celine, our main character, she's we're, we're in her head for the entire story. This is a first person narrative. Is the daughter of Turkish immigrants, but she was born and raised in America. And she is starting her freshman year at Harvard University in 1995. She has a passion for literature and language, yet she takes these random classes her first year in these in subjects she has no interest in or knows absolutely nothing about. Celine is a bit adrift. She's socially awkward, and despite her interest in language, she's she has a difficult time communicating with, with her peers. She initiates an email conversation with a, a guy in her Russian language class named Ivan, who is from Hungary. And Ivan is a senior majoring at mathematics. And through these email conversations, she develops a crush on Ivan. Through the novel, Celine becomes more withdrawn and awkward as she overanalyzes language and her interactions with others. At its core, the Idiot is not just an existential novel, it is a coming of age story. 
as Celine navigates school, first love, and kind of coming to terms or beginning to understand what it is she wants to do with her life. And we, it's hinted at that very early on that she, that she wants to become a writer. I love that Bottomen titled this book, The Idiot, because Bottomen herself went to Harvard University and let me read this on the back. Oh, no, that's on the back of the sequel, which is over there. Let me get it. It is either or, sidebar, and this is either or. Um, by the time I post this video, this book is not out yet. I was very, very lucky to, and very really chuffed to win a uh, an arc of this which is the sequel to The Idiot. Um, so Elif Bottomen has, uh, she went to Harvard and she has a PhD in comparative, sorry, she went, did she go to Harvard? I think she went to Harvard, but she also holds a PhD in comparative literature from Stanford University. So she wrote a book called The Possessed, Adventures with Russian Books and the People Who Read Them. And it's basically like essays on, um, in witty essays and it's a nonfiction about Russian literature, but the possessed. So yeah, we have the idiot. She's paying her homage to her homage to Dostoevsky, but um, the possessed is also how Dostoevsky's novel Demons is sometimes titled. It's either called Demons or the Possessed. Let's just get back to let's get back to this idiot. So Celine completely embodies this title. So yes, we do have Elif Bottomen playing homage to Dostoevsky, but to really understand why she called this book the idiot, you kind of have to dive into the definitions of an idiot. So the first and primary definition of an idiot is a person who is a fool or stupid person. The second definition, and which is now out of date, it's considered offensive, we don't use the word in this way anymore. It was a medical term for someone who was considered to be intellectually deficient. I do think that the Greek origin and what the Greek, the Greek origin of this word is relevant here. So the Greek word is idios, meaning private, not in the public eye. One's own are the kind of the three definitions of idios. Celine embodies all of those definitions. She often feels like she's observing life from the outside and has a difficult time understanding the interactions and communications that are occurring around her. She overanalyzes interaction. Couple that with her being introverted and reserved and naive, she really feels like she's just not getting it. And so she often feels stupid. She often feels like she's intellectually impaired. And she also feels like she is just in her own, she is not just feels, she is in her own head. B before the first chapter, and I did flag it, bottom in starts with a quote from Marcel Proust's second volume of In Search of Lost Time Within a Burning Grove. I'm not going to read the quote because it's, it's extremely long, but this particular quote is about youth and adolescence and how it is the time that one gets to learn and explore. Bottomman is setting up the entire premise of this novel with that quote alone. She's letting us know with the title and with that quote that Celine is going to be frustrating. She's young, she's immature in some ways, she's still figuring life, life out. And there's a quote that I'm pulling from the story where it's one of the only times I think in the novel where Celine, you, you know she's writing her narrative, but she's kind of stepping away from this claustrophobic 1995 Harvard world and she's speaking to her younger self from, uh, from, an, from, an, from an older perspective. And she says, it can be really exasperating to look back at your past. What's the matter with you? I want to ask her, my younger self, shaking her shoulder. Through the novel, Celine observes and questions how the grammatical structures of languages construct worlds because the grammatical structure of a language will have an impact on interpretation. When viewed from this perspective, everyday interactions with most people we don't think twice about send Celine down a path of subjectivity and she overanalyzes 
pretty much everything. The more she dives into languages and literature, she realizes that she also does perceive the world differently from her peers and her ability to communicate becomes more hampered. So the more she analyzes, the more she just almost in a way becomes mute. What's really interesting is that because this takes place in 1995, we have this introduction of email that complicates things further. We get this extra layer of subjectivity in language and communication that gets added. So Celine and Yvonne send these really cryptic and complex emails back and forth to each other. And the majority of their messages really make no sense. It's nonsense. And they both seem to write these philosophical messages to each other that you're like what are they saying you know do they and they don't often know what they're saying to each other or what the other person is saying back to them there is something really interesting happening in these mirror in these emails the barrier that the computer screen introduction introduces to conversation allows for these these conversations to be more ridiculous in a way that would be way more awkward awkward in a face-to-face -face interaction when Celine and Yvonne have face-to-face -face interactions, they are extremely awkward. And there are even times where, because we know Celine has a crush on Yvonne, where I wanted to grab her by the shoulder and be like, girl, this how you flirt? <laughs> you know, she was so awkward. Even Yvonne is awkward, but Yvonne is less awkward than, than Celine. Many people who read The Idiot from the reviews that I've seen and, and listened to, they get frustrated with Yvonne because in a way he definitely does lead her on. I'm not going to lie. He, he, he plays with her emotions a little bit, a lot bit. <laughs> However, I found this really realistic because I think a lot of times this has happened in youth. In, in, in young crushes, even through college, where clearly these two people have a connection, but they never move past a certain point. It's a lot of interpretation and nobody really says, or, or even if one person confesses their feelings to the other, the other person's really quite cryptic and you never really know, or it seems like this relationship never kind of takes off anywhere. It just stays in this area of gray, even though they, they do have a chemistry, they do have a type of connection. So that didn't bother me because when you look at young relationships, middle school, high school, college, a lot of relationships I've seen, you know, can, can straddle this line. And there were times when I, when Celine definitely had an open door to kind of interact with Yvonne in a way that I think would have opened Yvonne up a bit more. But again, she's she's very awkward, she's naive, she's reserved, and she's insecure in a lot of ways. So those interactions only move past a certain point, but I, I do think that that's the point. I didn't dislike Yvonne. I didn't. Um, again, I found it to be realistic. Not saying that it wasn't frustrating at times, but I found it to be really realistic. And as we know, we have a sequel but I'm not spoiling anything. Yeah. <laughs> so there's also the use of email in this novel that is extremely nostalgic. I do typically tend to get annoyed when modern technology, it has too much of a pre presence in a novel, just because for me personally, I spend all day on technology. I've got my work phone. I've got my personal phone. I've got three screens for work, you know what I mean? Just, you know, if I'm at my office, I've got three monitors and a work phone and, and a desk phone and a, and a cell phone and my personal phone. And I'm on technology all the time that I do typically like my literature to be a break from that, which is why I don't use Kindles or eBooks, just because I just don't want to look at another screen. I don't care how much that screen looks like paper. It's just not for me. I, I want to put a device, a device down and pick up something that doesn't have to be charged. But again, this felt really nostalgic. And I think bottom and nailed it. We do get email conversations in here and it just felt like the 90s. It didn't feel like 
scrolling through social media or reading a text or anything like that. And I, and I appreciated that. It does feel like this was written in a way in the 90s and not to, published in 2018. I do think this took her quite a bit of time to, to write this novel, but by the time it was published, it was 2018. So I do think that it does feel like it's from the 90s. So Lynn, the more that she interacts with Yvonne, the more she's overanalyzing her interactions and emails with Yvonne. And of course she has this massive on crush on this handsome Hungarian guy, right? So she goes and talks to a school counselor about this. And the counselor says to her, thanks to this email, you can have a completely idealized relationship. You risk nothing behind your, behind your computer screen. You are completely safe. How relevant is that? Bottoman really hits the nail on the head when it comes to how technology impacts communication. Think about it. I mean, now we have texting, direct messages, comments in, in our, on our posts or video section. It's comment sections on our posts or, or videos and everything that comes with social media. Communication in a lot of ways has been cheapened because you're not getting that face-to-face -face interaction in which you can gain a lot from a lot from somebody's body language or the tone of their voice. However, there are times, of course, there are, you know, technology has enhanced communication. I mean, I think it's great that through this medium, this platform, I can talk to, I can have a video and kind of essentially in a way be talking to somebody on the other side of the world and people can leave comments, people who I never would have otherwise been able to have contact with. So, I mean, it definitely has its pros and cons. Also, there's a bit of dramatic irony, irony here. This is 1995 and reading this in the 21st century, it being published in the 21st century, we know how much farther this is going to come. I mean, those of us who were, um, remember the 90s or in before, before, you know, with email first getting started and all that stuff and, and before that, um, did we, we, don't, we didn't know this is where communication would end up. What's the last generation to remember a pre-social media world? Is it millennials? Maybe the oldest Gen Z, maybe those who are still born in the late 90s. But think about it. MySpace came around in the early 2000s and the first iPhone was released in 2007. So, I mean... Are the are this is this is this I could be wrong, but are millennials the last generation to be in a pre-social media world? I think so because if you were a Gen Z, you're autom you were born and and there was my MySpace was fizzling. Well, no, my if you're a late if if you're an older Gen Z, you would remember MySpace being around, but millennials and older know what it's like to live in a world that's pre-social media completely. Remember chat rooms and AOL instant messaging? Yes. <laughs> All right, let's move forward. As I said earlier, this is quite an existential novel. The more Celine feels isolated due to her inability to communicate and understand others and relate to others, this existential tension that she feels intensifies. Celine is a deep thinker and that's why I really enjoyed her character and being in her head. She doesn't take anything at face value and she's willing to ask questions that other people do not think to ask. And it bothers her and she's baffled that nobody else asks these questions. <laughs> and I'm, I'm that way. There are things that I'm that type of person, no matter what I come in contact with in books, on the, the news, in articles, documentaries, whenever I come into contact with something, I challenge it. I ask questions. I dig deeper. I never take anything at face value. I'm always asking why. And Selene is like that. And it bothers me that other people aren't like that either. I'm like, do you believe everything that you're presented with? Uh, that baffles me. <laughs> that really does. Um, and this is actually why she's drawn to Yvonne. Because Yvonne, he, he, goes with, he goes along with this. Because in a way, he is that way. And so in that way, they're quite compatible. And we have a quote because again, this is Celine's frustration that nobody else seems to ask the heavier questions. 
No one else seemed to find it appalling or shameful that a literature professor should stand up in front of a classroom and say that interpretation was infinitely useless. Celine often thinks about how people relate to one another and what it means to be a being that is known and understood by other beings. Remember, she feels like an idiot. She, she doesn't quite feel like she's getting on with her peers or, you know, like others are. She's not really meshing in some social settings as other people are. She, one phrase that re pre repeats quite often in this phrase, and here I quote, one, only one thought brought me comfort and it was, what is man? What is man that thou art mindful of him? This is actually a Bible verse, specifically Psalms 8, 4. And, it's, and in its biblical context, we have David, who is the author of the Psalms. He's proclaiming how he is so astounded that the creator of the universe cares about the intricacies of each man and woman on earth. So what does it really mean for someone else to be mindful of you in the midst of everything else? With all of this stuff going on in the world and all of these other people that we interact with, it really is quite fascinating to think that there are people who are mindful of you. So in this case in particular, Selene is so hooked on Yvonne. She is, she's mindful of him, but is he mindful of her in the way that she's mindful of him? And that disconnect and kind of that crisis internally that can happen when you are into somebody more than they're into you. But also how great it is when that mindfulness is mutual. So Lynn does like to write. And like I said earlier, the, ink, the idiot has inklings that she may want to pursue becoming an author. The idiot does explore how narratives are constructed and how those around us serve as active or passive characters in our own stories. Celine and Svetlana have an interesting dialogue about this. Svetlana says, we each have our own, we each have our own roles. It's like an unspoken contract. With you, she's saying to Celine, there's more instability and tension because I know you're making up a story too. And in your story, I'm just a character. Celine responds, I still think that everyone experiences their own life as a narrative. If you didn't have some kind of ongoing story in your mind, how would you know who you are when you woke up in the morning? Svetlana says, that's a weak definition of narrative. That's saying that narrative is just memory plus causality. But for us, the narrative has aesthetics too. Side note, bottom in, talking about aesthetics here, makes a huge comeback in either or this follow-up but that's all i'm gonna say either or is also the title is hearkening to another text called either or by either or by the existentialist kierkegaard so that's all i'm gonna say about that coming out may 26th 24th my bad may 24th <laughs> you can't tell by how much i'm kind of diving into some of these themes i love this book oh my goodness this book surprised me I was not expecting to, like I said, I have a hard time sometimes getting with contemporary novels. This novel is so intelligent. It's actually also very funny, but in that dry, sarcastic way, some of these jokes, you're going to get them or you're not, you're going to get it, get it or you don't. One of the reviews says humor so dry, it calls for olives. That is spot on <laughs> because the humor is dry as bones but if you like dry sarcastic humor boom bottoman is also one of those authors that doesn't spell everything out for the reader in some cases the author sorry the reader either is either going to get the reference or not she's not going to spell it out for you and you have in some of the references you're you would have had to been alive at a certain place in time to rec to recollect what she's talking about she calls out places in New England, uh, this is a, this is a, this is a clothing chain or really clean, uh, it's kind of like a Nordstrom rack called Filene's Basement that you really only see in New England, but it came out of Massachusetts. She calls out, um, so again, if you've never been to a Filene's Basement and you're completely unfamiliar with it in New England, what does Filene's Basement mean to you? Nothing, <laughs> you know, and why would you look that up otherwise? <laughs> you know what I mean? She calls out how in, Men's Health Magazine, Chili's, 
the artichoke, onion artichoke looking thing. It was an appetizer on Chili's menu that got called out in Men's Health Magazine by being the worst appetizer, the unhealthiest appetizer in America. And so for a brief time, Chili's took it off their menu because they got called out. So stuff like that where you're just like, I remember that. Yeah, and it kind of makes it feel like you're in the club. You know what I mean? So, and then there are other things where she's alluding to things and she's dropping breadcrumbs. And if you just take two seconds to look it up, it's going to make a big difference. She does reference some paintings in some of, in, in one part of this book. And if you just take two seconds to look at what that Picasso image picture is or that painting is, it's it, it it's it's hearkening to Celine's internal existential crisis. So this is one of those books where it is worth going through the breadcrumbs. Some people who read, so this is a pretty divisive book. People get it or they don't. I don't know how many reviews I've seen where people are like, I don't get it. That's the point. Um, and they do get annoyed because there are these references and they're like, what is she talking about? And people just, they don't get it, but again, Bottoman does this deliberately because she's playing around and kind of poking fun at the reader because this is the entire premise of this book. Those, e even if you get this book, there are certain references or certain things that you're like, I don't know if I get that. You're not going to get everything in this book. Some of it, some of the sentences are nonsense because you're in Celine's head and she doesn't get everything because Celine is, has these interactions and people are referencing things to her that she doesn't understand. So she's kind of poking fun at the entire premise of her novel. And I think that that is very brilliant. I love that kind of thing. If you really want the challenge and you really want to go on a hunt for quite a few clues, Bottomin also uses a lot of symbols. So, so for example, in the second half of this book, Celine goes to Hungary and she, for the summer, for summer break, and there are two main symbols that I noticed during that part of the novel the color yellow pops up a lot and dogs pop up a lot and they do have a meeting Celine is alluding to something and how the dogs interact with Celine or how she's watching a dog interact from a distance is all kind of harkening back to something everything that Bottomman does is deliberate nothing is wasted and I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of that kind of thing. I also like Bottomman's writing style. Overall, it's quite simple. And it does feel contemporary because it is a contemporary novel, but it is poignant. She has a way of creating the sense of nostalgia and tension within Celine without a whole lot of flowery language. But there are some very well-constructed sentences in this book. So, uh, Alif Bottomman also is a master at comedic timing. She just will drop a line and move on. And it's, it's, it's perfect timing. It's funny. She cracks the joke and she doesn't belabor it. I found being in Celine's head the in, for what, 400 pages? How long is this novel? About 420 pages to be really enjoyable. I really like Celine. I found her to be really endearing. Like I said, she, she's witty and in her confusion, and her over analyzing. Sometimes I just wanted to pat her on the shoulder. I'm like, girl, it's gonna be okay. Girl, you only 18. It'll work out. <laughs> yeah, you just, she's just, Celine was just a joy to, to spend 400 pages with. I also found her awkwardness to be, to be relatable. There are times in some social interactions I can be kind of awkward not gonna lie as I've gotten older though the more especially when it came, comes to work and having to interact with different types of people I've had jobs that were very very social even though they put me outside of my comfort zone I've learned as I've gotten older how to navigate the social interactions a lot better but I do find a lot of social interaction to be very very draining and I, I think we all do it some more than others. We tend to overanalyze social interaction, looks and body language and stuff like that. And so it was definitely relatable. I am going to put this down. My mouth is very dry. <laughs> My throat's dry. If you can't tell again by how much detail I went into the, to with this, this particular review, I was not expecting 
for the idiot to be one of those books that I just became enamored with. When I picked this book up for this year, I didn't know that a sequel was coming out. I didn't see that a, the sequel was coming out until January. And I was like, I need that as soon as it drops. And then I was able to win a copy of it from Penguin Press. And I just, I became a stan. I became an Aleve Bottom and stan. I did. It's just, I still can't stop thinking about this novel. I, it took me a long time after I read it to write my review because I have so many notes and annotations in it. I just, I just can't stop thinking about it. It was so funny. And there's also just something about it that I just can't put my finger on why it was so enjoyable. Some books just have it. Some things, they just got it or they don't. And for me, the idiot has it. It's probably one of my top contemporary novels. When I did my favorite books of all, my top 10 favorite books currently at the beginning of the year, I have contemporary novels and classics in there. The more that I continue to dive into more contemporary literature, I might have to separate those lists out. I might have to do my top, I might have to do my favorite classics and then my favorite contemporary novels. It can be hard to put sometimes classics and contemporary novels in, in within one list. I, I can, but you know, it's hard for me to put as much as I enjoyed The Idiot and it's one of, it will be in the contender probably of my top reads of 2022. Surprisingly, that I was not expecting. Um, is it a Jane Eyre for me? No. Is it a Brothers Karamazov for me? No. Those novels do something completely different. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to wrap this up. I am totally invested in Celine and her life. I really, I'm at this point of this recording, I am halfway, more than halfway through, but not too far from the halfway point of either or. And again, I'm into it just as much I'm as I'm into the idiot. And I'm hoping, and, and the either or takes place in 1996. So we're in Celine's second year of Harvard. And I'm hoping that Bottomman releases a book per year. Well, per... So I hope you get, let me, let me backtrack. I hope that Bottomman does a book for 1997, 1998. So we get all of Celine's undergrad year years and each year is a book. That's what I'm hoping. This book, the way that it reads, and because it takes place in 1999, would make a great indie film. Man, I, I, I'm going to stop raving. I love this book and I am shoving it to all of my friends. I'm, I have a, a second copy of it. I am giving that away to a friend. I have got three bookstagram friends reading this book after I, I'm, I'm like, you need to read this book. And they're all of them are like, yeah, this book is not what I was expecting. This is great. Read the idiot. If you like contemporary literature that is just unexpectedly good and funny and smart and if you have a passion for the Russian classics, go for it. This is this this is gonna be your jam. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up. There we go. The Idiot by Leaf Bottomman. I gave this a five out of five. Probably one of my favorite contemporary contemporary reads of all time. And let me know if you've read it. What are your favorite millennial fiction? novels if you have any i'm going to probably do a whole separate video on millennial fiction so you guys know what books i mean that i'm personally going to read within that category but if you have any recommendations for me please put them in the comments below if you are now interested in reading the idiot please let me know and if you do end up reading it whether you hate it or love it i would love to know what you thought about it because again this book is it's pretty divisive i'm going to wrap it up all of my links are down below my instagram my blog like, subscribe, leave me a comment, and I'll see you in the next one.